How many of you have listened to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast? I can't tell you that react how much that means to us. Yeah. Welcome back to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Brandon. Join us as we wrestle with what it takes to transform ourselves and the businesses we lead. This new camera angle makes my arms look smaller than yours. I'm noticing that and I really appreciate it. I thought you did that on purpose. No, I, I don't. I didn't. And I, I am not happy with it. All right, Alex, my man, we're, we're back for part two. And, um, you know, this decidedly, we, we were going to keep this more focused on entrepreneurship, your leadership journey. So I titled it, and I don't know if it was kind of a goofy title, but making Alex Duda, right? How have you sort of put this life together, right? That you've created for yourself, uh, both in uh, building and, and ultimately selling a successful restoration company to now you're in a venture backed software startup and, 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 and we're maybe we'll touch on some of the other and uh, during our chat again today. But um, for people that listening to this and you haven't heard the first part with Alex, uh, go back and pick up that first part. We talk about uh, certain lifestyle practices and disciplines that you have, uh, some philosophical stuff about how you approach your work. And um, we talked about booze, I think, at one point. And so we're just going to, we're going to hang with a Z just so we're booze. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm a little bit Sound stuffed up. So I want to make sure that yeah, my words come yeah. across very clearly. Yes. Keep it PG. Booze. Yeah. Um, so we're going to kind of hang in that pocket. Here's how I want to open it up, man. I've been, I've been following you on social media as have, I think a lot of people in our industry and you are regularly posting content. And we just talked about this at the outset of our conversation. Um, you have a similar approach to content production as we do. It's capturing all the real moments throughout the day, all the ways we document our work and then sharing that stuff out, kind of pulling back the curtain. It's great. Um, but in addition to the content, man, you have a lot of stuff going on. I mean, just to rattle off what I've seen via social media, which is, of course, the whole truth, I'm, I'm sure, about your life. Uh, you know, you're building your dream home. You, uh, you've got this venture-backed software startup, which is no small undertaking to begin with. You, you lead at least one uh, private Google, or excuse me, uh, Facebook group. Uh, you're active on LinkedIn. Um, you obviously are leading and developing your the software startup team. You're meeting with investors. You have existing investors that you have to steward those relationships. Uh, you have young. You have a young child. Children, child, child, just one. Sophia, child. Yeah. You're yep. married. Uh, you're a private pilot, uh, and you fly regularly. All, like so. Here's my question. How do you choose what not to do? Ooh, <laughs> that's a tough, that's a tough question, but I think I boil it down into two things. If it doesn't bring me value and I don't enjoy doing it, I don't do it. Or if it doesn't bring value in general, I would say. So if it's not valuable and I don't enjoy it, it gets cut out. The other thing is I think people if you look at the different things that people can do, they kind of fall into different buckets. There are things that people are really bad at, not meant to do. There are things that people are all right at. They can do sort of kind of okay. There's also things that people can do that they're great at, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm great at a handful of things. But I think if you're an entrepreneur or if you really want to get to the next level, you need to focus on your superpowers. And only do your superpowers and then find ways to delegate and or build systems around the things that maybe you're great at, maybe you're mediocre at, maybe you're bad at, it doesn't matter and take those off your plate. So like I could sit and write a good Facebook post, but that's not my superpower. So I go find other people and I build systems around a Facebook post. My superpower is the knowledge of the restoration industry and restoration entrepreneurship. So I need to find a system through which I can basically feed somebody who is whose superpower is writing to be able to write Facebook posts yeah. and then make it like seamless and natural. And that's when calls like these get recorded and then they get watched and then they get created. So I think a lot of people like they're afraid to give up things that they're great at and good at and maybe mediocre at because they feel like, oh, what's my purpose if I don't, you know, if I give up those things. But the reality is you need to find your superpower, focus on your superpower 
and delegate and get rid of all those other things. And your superpower is that one thing that everybody's like, you do very well. And everybody's like, how in the world did you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, some people, you know, like think of people who play instruments, for example, it's like, how in the world did you hit the piano and all that notes so well? Like it came. And then that person's answer would be like, I don't know, man, that just kind of came naturally to me. Like I learned it over time and I just kind of picked it up. Um, so that's, that's my answer to that. What would you say your superpower is then? My superpower <laughs> came from a very young age. And I think my superpower is actually dreaming. Um, so we kind of talked about my childhood, first first generation American immigrant, parents were working a lot. I um, probably had a, and still have a very interesting, maybe rather abrasive personality. I would get in trouble at school a lot, do stupid stuff all the time. And I'd get in trouble a lot. And, you know, old Eastern European in trouble. It's like you get everything taken away from you for like a week to two weeks and you're stuck in your room because you can't do anything else. And like my coping mechanism became like daydreaming. So I, I remember like sitting on my bed and pretending like I was driving a truck down the road. And then, you know, then I envisioned myself building skyscrapers and like I would dream like I drive up to the truck site with the big dump truck and get out of the truck and hop up on you know, ladders and stuff. And like, I'd even pretend like I'm fixing up stuff. So it was almost this weird thing that maybe most people would make fun of me for at the time. It's like, you're enacting these things. And eventually I did some acting and such, but I realized that not a lot of people, it doesn't come easy to a lot of people to think of the future, to dream or to visualize or to come up with that. And that's just something that like comes very naturally to me. Like I close my eyes, imagine a scene, look at how something looks like, and then communicate it well. Um, and that's my superpower. So like the concept of Albi, like I'm horrible at the meticulous project management part of software where you have to write these really flushed out tickets with all the requirements of what things can do. But like, I can see a future of restoration tech with everything I do, I guess. Yeah. That's what comes naturally to me. It's like seeing the future or seeing a world where this is different and being able to dream it and then being able to articulate it to other people. That's interesting. I just have a question, kind of a follow-up to, to that. First off, I can <laughs> totally relate to your comment about the fact that there's almost like some fear around personal value that we build around all these kind of auxiliary tasks that we just really don't love. And we know that are a weakness, you know? So it's like, I, I think that's a piece that I I've been personally wrestling with quite a bit recently. And, is just being able to segregate yourself. And and honestly, man, like in full transparency with you, you saying like, hey, I think dreaming's my superpower. I, I think that's hard sometimes for, I know for me, like for me to say that's valuable, like that is special. That is the unique thing. And all these taskings are things that we can hire out and that we can develop personnel to help us execute on. All right, but here's, here's where I want to go with this. So you are living or have lived kind of like two different places where you guys, you were a part of building a restoration company where there was all these transitions and stuff that you went through. I'm going to assume a lot more bootstrapping, right? Like this is grassroots. We're feeding our own machine. Now you've got this kind of investor, investor partnership type relationship with Albiware. Okay, go back to restoration days as you're settling in on some of your superpowers what was some of the mindset, you know, or, or uh, kind of posture that you had to have as you're trying to get the business to these points where you can begin delegating some of these things? Because I know some people are listening and be like, yeah, I'd love to toss off 20 things, but, but it's hard for me to accomplish that or see that I can even get there. So yeah. What did that look like early days for you, man? While you were dreaming, the, the work had to get done. The projects had to get managed, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's true. Um, in the vein of dreaming, even in resto days, I think a remarkable moment was when Warner Cruz, the owner of JC restoration had invited us over to tour his facility. Mm. And I remember my father and I had gone there and we walk in and, you know, beautiful facility. There was this sign that said, welcome Nick and Alex. And we walk into, you know, this reception area, shake his hand. He had an executive assistant, see the war room, see this world-class facility. And I remember thinking to myself and then even when my father and I left there we were like well if Warner can do it we can do it too like what does he have that nobody else does and that's what pushed us through from like day one when literally dad's garage 
air movers, DHUs. We had to go rent our first space because the freeze was coming in and we couldn't keep the DHUs in the garage and such. We were always motivated by, well, if other people can do it, we can do it ourselves as well. What does that other person have that we don't have? They have two hands, two feet, you know? Yeah, Warmer was a little intimidating because he had this awesome business school and went to Japan and such. But I always, I guess, related and always went with the mindset of if somebody else can do it, we can do it as well. As far as like delegating while in the field, I think there were a lot of challenges. Like there was never a challenge of giving up the work, right? We found technicians. We saw the value of, hey, us stopping to do the work within like three to six months of us starting the company. We had stopped like physically um, doing or leading the work. We had technicians and we would be more of a crew chief role and such. But some of the biggest challenges that we ran into were things like, um, we won't let somebody else answer the phone because we believe that the phone ringing is like super, super, super important. And we don't want to lose that job. And, oh, we can't find somebody who can write an estimate as good as we write it. So we were kind of holding on to those things. Um, and it was like a huge struggle to let go of items. Um, and eventually we were forced just because we had a lot of work and there was nobody else to do it. So I can't say like there was a mindset shift. It was almost by, by the fact that we were overwhelmed. There really wasn't enough time of day. We were working these 16 hour days. We had to eventually let go of things. And then there was this whole battle of trying to accept that, you know, maybe nobody's going to do it as good as you think you do it. Or maybe the tasks, like no one individual contributor is going to be able to fulfill all the roles that you filled right at the beginning, taking the call, doing the work, signing the job, doing the estimate. But then like 12 to 16 months later, we now realized that we had individual contributors that started doing things better. They didn't do the whole together, but they were starting to do things way better than we would have done them. Way more organized project managers, way more meticulous, way more organized crew chiefs, way more, you know, hardworking that could lift heavier bags than we could and do work that way people over the phone that were way more pleasant than we were in at three o'clock in the morning. And then it kind of clicked afterwards to 80% done by somebody else is a hundred percent freaking perfect. And then the second thing clicked is, Oh, you don't need to find the person that could do it all. Well, you need to find the people that can do little bits and pieces of it. And there's going to be people that can really knock your socks off into something specifically. I mean, we had an estimator. I was, decent at exact, I mean, I'd say pretty good. I'm an exact mate certified trainer, but like we had an estimator who had like a photographic memory. He can just pound out like $10 million a year worth of estimating work. When he worked at CWAF, he did actually $18 million a year of estimating work. Wow. I personally can't do that. Right. And yeah, it transitioned into, oh, we were kind of holding ourselves back by not looking for those people ahead of time and our self-limiting belief of we have to do everything. Nobody can do everything as good as we can. As entrepreneurs, no one can maybe do the whole thing as good as we can, but there's a ton of people that can do bits and pieces way better than we can. Well, wow, that's huge. I think that's super sound. And for those listening right now, maybe if you want a point of reference to maybe dive into that topic a little bit deeper, um, Who Not How is an excellent book uh, yes. for, for folks to take a look at to maybe help crack that code on how do I begin leveraging other people's specialties, right? Uh, yep. bigger, bigger piece of the puzzle. So that's cool. I, I actually, I, I, I want to dig in to my, my first question again. I want to circle at it from another angle here because while, while I agree with you and I think that took us off in a good direction in terms of delegation and the importance of identifying our superpower and all that, I also know that this, it, 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 it still is a struggle that I think all entrepreneurs and leaders have, which is some degree of, of shiny object syndrome in the sense of like you talked about doing things that you're um, you're great at and meant to do. I, I'm just curious about your decision-making process of how do you prioritize in a sea of lots of good, great things to do that may even tap into your superpower. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you discipline yourself and your team? And I know, and I know this to be true. My my very minimal dabbling in the software startup space enough that it traumatized me from wanting to get back into it is is this whole idea of creating a product roadmap that mm -hmm. that we can't create the next Google 
in V1 of our product, right? We can't 100%. create, the, you can't create the next, let's just in our industry, call it dash in version one, go out and cover all the scope of functionality and everything else day one. And so you're always managing a product roadmap of what are the most valuable features for us to develop first, next, et cetera, et cetera, from a cost standpoint, what people want, marketing, all that kind of thing, right? So similarly, yep. dude, how do you choose what to do first? Um, and how do you choose when to not do something that otherwise could be very good and could be a big opportunity? How do you choose between various lots of good things to do yep. <laughs> in order to focus on the most important thing? Like, what's your decision making process and how do you do that as a team? Because I imagine your team, you have a lot of creative thinkers on your team that are always coming up with new new ideas and, oh, we could do this and maybe even other verticals you guys could serve. But how do you stay disciplined? doing the important stuff that's right in front of you. Yeah. So I guess an example that I can give, and maybe it's not restoration specific, but a recent example that comes to mind is I was sitting in on a, on a sales team meeting and um, the sales team felt a little stuck and a little overwhelmed. And there was a bunch of different ideas of things that we should have done with the sales team. So you know, data needs to be cleaned up better. We need to get better automation. We need to um, try to call these different people, try to go into these different verticals and and so on and so forth. And like a bunch of different ideas were coming up and I could see like everybody, I guess the analogy I would give is like they're spinning their tires in mud and there's like a lot of momentum moving on in that conversation, but people were frustrated and there were no solutions. And I kind of, I don't know, out of intuition, just asked, hey, team, and this was a newer team also. Um, we had grown very rapidly from like four employees to now the sales team, I think, is around 18 employees. And I was like, hey, you know, what's our North Star in sales? I just had the intuition to ask that. And we got like eight to 10 different responses from the different team members there. Oh, it's how many demos we book or how many calls we make or, you know, uh, but nobody really mentioned the North Star. And like from our board approved plan, there was a North Star and the North Star was an ARR goal, which was a revenue goal, right? And it was the end result. So nobody knew it. So I, I threw it up on the board and I was like, okay, this is our North Star, right? It's like $400,000 of ARR every month needs to be closed. And then we went through and we also made the list of the problems that they were trying to tackle. It was like a list of 14. I'm like, which one of these things will really move the needle to hit that North star. And we ranked them from what well, we cut out the ones that didn't and we ranked them. And then I'm like, which one's the two X lever that we should focus on and put all of our time and energy. Like which one is that lever that will yield two X impact on our North star and also have the least amount of, of effort. And that's kind of how, how we looked at it. And we all came to the conclusion that who cares if our house is not in order, right? Who cares if our data and our CRM isn't as clean or, you know, our company isn't as perfect, right? As long as we're hitting these metrics, especially since everybody's comp plan and everything's tied to it, everybody succeeds. Another example, like, you know, customer success had brought up the fact that, you know, our billing system's kind of messed up. There's no direct tying on our user system to a billing system and it's a manual process. And then we went back to our, our mission. It's like our mission is to propel the restoration industry forward. We're like, okay, it's going to take us six months to build a building system with our engineers to be able to alleviate the pain that we have this person sitting here manually doing billing for restoration contractors. And it got a lot. I mean, we have thousands of users on the platform and it's literally a full-time job to do that. But I'm like, do we really want to take engineering resources away from our mission of propelling restoration forward? Like in those six months, we could build so much more and we've got a lot on our roadmap and kind of steer away from our North star of that to fulfill our selfish needs of getting our house in order. And that's kind of how I think of things. It's like, what are we trying to accomplish here? And okay, all of these different things we can do are great, but does this fit that North Star? So that's another way you can frame it. And then which one of these ideas is the 2X idea with the least amount of input needed or the least amount of effort needed? Um, and that's another matrix to look through it. I that's, love that. Super sound. That's a great way to think, dude. And I, uh, Very that's exactly what I was looking for. That's awesome, man. Um, because I think we all struggle with that, right? With deciding amongst various good options 
I, I think that's a really great way to think about it and simplify the thinking. Okay. How do you how do you feel that you can introduce or and or adopt that kind of same mentality in the personal life? Like, because I, I mean, I'm assuming there's a lot of alignment in terms of the way that you behave and act and lead yourself. So what's the tie in there? How do I do that same kind of concept, develop, you know, developing my North Star in my personal life? I think they they are very synergetic. And I think um, personal life to me, you know, if you're talking about personal finances and then personal uh, being from a personal finance standpoint, I think like the most successful or people that build themselves up personally or their personal net worth the highest, if you like a Warren Buffett, Mark Cuban, and so on and so forth, they don't get involved or don't invest in things that they don't think they have an unfair competitive advantage in, right? So even there, they create these things called investment thesis seat theses thesi anyway theses they <laughs> we'll create an investment thesis <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they create an investment thesis around something specifically then when you go on to like personal like i think every family um there's this book called family boardroom too um and we're starting we've started to implement those principles in our family but i think it, there's something magical that happens when you and a spouse or a partner um co-creates together and you formulate north stars or a mission for a family's existence um, and kind of work together as a family towards that. And it needs to fit the bucket of the reason for our family existing and what we want to do. And if it doesn't fit that bucket, then it kind of drops lower to the list, or maybe we don't do it. Um, at the end of the day, a family is an organization, a non-for-profit, uh, church or whatever is an organization. Um, a company is an organization, a country is an organization, and it's an organization of people that have one thesis or a mission or a North star. And I think it's very important to look at it from that lens and to focus on that North star without getting distracted by other things. Love it. Yeah, that's good. All right. <clears throat> I got another topic meetings, <laughs> meetings, you know, you, yep. I would imagine you lot have a <laughs> lot of different kinds of meetings Mm -hmm. Can you give us, I mean, so you have the experience, obviously, of running a restoration company, and there's a meeting cadence that's required yep. at some level to run a successful restoration company. Um, now you're in a venture-backed software startup in a, a, all kinds of new types of meetings and audiences. Can you give us some of your best practices or um, maybe some principles that you try to lead meetings by to make them productive? Yeah, Absolutely. So I think the biggest thing that you need to understand about a meeting is like the the cost of a meeting. So if you're going to host a company meeting and you've got, I don't know, let's say an average person's worth 40 bucks an hour, right? And you could even do an opportunity cost. An average person could produce $1,000 an hour and you've got 50 people in that meeting. That's $50,000 in that hour. So you need to understand that. You need to deliver, out deliver that much value within that meeting or else you've, you've cost that meeting money. So I like... I don't take meetings lightly and I don't schedule meetings just for the sake of having meetings. I have ultimate intentionality behind every meeting. And like in the back of my head, I know, Hey, these people are taking time out of their day to meet with me or we're taking time out of our day to meet on this specific topic. Like the intentionality needs to be set and it can't just be a meeting for the sake of meetings. I also believe in, believe in rituals. Um, and by rituals, I mean like, different things that repeat themselves over and over. They build themselves on, on top of each other. Um, and by rituals, I also mean, how can you incorporate the different people in the meeting to feel human and to all feel present in one place? So oftentimes like people tend to jump into meetings and get straight to the chase. I always reserve, you know, four to five minutes to talk about, Hey, here's a trip report or, Hey, what was a win? Or, Hey, what'd you do this weekend? Right. To have the different people kind of feel human and be there. And they're not just there for that specific meeting. As far as cadences, I think like there's different types of meetings or different types of cadences for different types of meetings. So typically we operate off of EOS on both companies, both the restoration company and the um, software company. So every single week there's like a departmental meeting and we follow the U.S. structure. I think the U.S. structure is fabulous in the fact that, you know, you start off with five minutes of good news. Then afterwards, you go into scorecards and you're reviewing the metrics as a team. So you're reviewing your North Star that we just talked about. 
Then afterwards, you're going into holding each other accountable on to-do lists and checking those things off. And then afterwards, you're talking about your rocks, which are your like 90-day things that you're trying to move the needle on. So everybody's super laser focused. And then that all feeds into an IDS session, which is identify, discuss, and solve. So basically, whatever's holding you back, like a great question to always ask in a meeting if you're talking about numbers. It's like, okay, great. We didn't hit these numbers. What's the number one thing holding us back from hitting these numbers or from doing this outcome or from moving the company forward? And then having a discussion there where where you're solving things. As far as like other types of meetings, um, I think leadership retreats are very important. We do them quarterly. And a leadership retreat in my book consists of the leadership team getting unplugged from the day-to-day -day business where they're just stuck in the weeds and into the regular monotony of the world and going to do something together. So, you know, we'll book a cabin in Gatlinburg or up in Wisconsin or whatever. And we have a couple of purposes. One is review the previous quarter. Two is set the new quarter plan. Three is do something around our core values. So like we're very important, we're very adamant about how our core values are. And every, we have two activities that we do as a leadership team that pushes us out of our comfort zone. So it could be anything from, we haven't done fire walk, walking yet, but that's like an next activity. But like, we've done things like extreme hikes through really bad weather and, and stuff like that to, um, if somebody's uncomfortable with presenting in front of a crowd or stuff like that, we'll do things like those to help push people outside of their comfort zone, kind of realign us with our values. Then there's board meetings. If you don't have a board, I would still put together a board meeting, the concept of every single quarter, synthesizing and looking over your business and how it's worked, I think is huge as well. And then the last type of meeting that I use is a one-on-one, -on -one, half an hour feedback between you and your direct reports. If you have any direct reports, um, all focused on how can I serve the direct report so that way they can achieve their goals and their dreams bigger. And again, an awesome question to just start those things off with. Well, when are, what are you winning at? Let's celebrate. And then two, what's the number one thing that's holding you back? And giving feedback 100% on what you think, speaking your mind, whether they like it or not, in a polite way, um, and giving them that feedback so that way they can better themselves. I love that. I, I think that's a challenge that a lot of teams are faced with in terms of how they're deploying a one-on-one -on -one and they just kind of lose the point of who it's for and and they're still trying to use that meeting or leverage that meeting almost to get what they want or what they need. And I just yep. love the fact that you're completely unapologetic about the fact that that is a meeting for them. It's their development and that's your opportunity to be a steward and a guide to help them achieve that thing. I just think that's really mission critical that many of us are not, not connecting the dots to in terms of the success and engagement in our organization. So, yeah. Hey, so <clears throat> You've been in this process of building a company where you the the strategy you've deployed requires outside investment. You you've been working with venture capitalists. What is the biggest thing you've learned about working with investors and managing that relationship? Because there's a lot of people that they're seeing all the M and A activity in the industry and they're like, oh my gosh, I I want to jump on that gravy train and they want to prepare their company to sell and get you know potentially have a second bite at the apple, work with a PE company, all this stuff. What's what's the biggest thing that you've learned and maybe one of the surprises about working with investors as you've been doing that with Albie? Absolutely. I think one of the surprises was the fact that investors and capital markets are depicted in, I think, a negative way. People feel like they lose control. People feel like the investors come take you over and push you in a different way and 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 so on and so forth. And Maybe part of that is true, but I personally haven't experienced that. Now, granted, all of our investments are minority stake investments. You know, my co-founder and I own the majority of the company and we still have full control. But I think the value that somebody can bring as an investor to the table is huge. And I think that it's kind of a myth and an illusion that that person is going to take over your business, especially if you're the operator. Like at the end of the day, even if you own 0% of the company, if you're the operator of the company, you actually have the most control because that investor actually needs you because if you leave, what's that investor going to do? So I think that's something that like surprised me. Um, the biggest thing I've learned, well, there's two things that I've learned, but one, my relationships with money and capital has changed a little bit. I realized that, a lot of times as business owners, 
we maybe imposter syndrome kicks up and we don't give ourselves enough credit and we're always told we're not enough. We try to go get those lines of credit. We get denied on those and we're getting beat up over capital, which ultimately what I learned is capital is just a freaking commodity. Like the banks, the investors, the capital markets need entrepreneurs like us who are building places for their stupid money to get placed into this. And oftentimes the flip, the, the script is the exact opposite where it's like us as founders, we're almost like begging for capital. We're, we're going to those banks and going through all the loopholes and such. Um, and obviously there's, there's strict terms for a reason and, and it's, it's hard to get capital for a reason, but most people don't understand that. And they, they almost beat up the value of what they're creating as a business and your business and your enterprise is the machine that uses up that capital to produce future values. And what you've built as an entrepreneur is very valuable and they need you maybe just as much as you need them. Man, that's a great one. I, I would have not seen that one coming in a million years. And yet I just think that's profoundly important for people to consider. Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, you know, much different circumstances likely than than where you're at but we're in similar circumstances currently where we're having these kinds of conversations about certain projects and opportunities and i feel myself sliding into that where uh, where you almost feel yourself shrinking a little bit because you aren't the one that can address the the cash or the financial demand of the project and and so honestly like hearing you say that even for me i'm like you know what he's freaking right i need to own that as well like in my own yeah um, we were just talking about that yesterday just how just the there, there's a lot of those mindset shifts right uh, that need to have yeah. it starts to when it comes to money and investors they just have a different vantage point we were sitting in the office with with a guy who's a serial investor and entrepreneur and hearing the way he thinks about cash and thinks about debt and I, debt yeah, I think is is uh, it, I mean it's definitely more in line with what you're talking about mm -hmm. being that uh, flipping the script. Oh or, yeah, money's everywhere. I, I think a ton. There's more money than there are places to put the money. Yeah, there's a ton more capital. Like talk about abundance mindset. We're all trained with scarcity mindset. Oh, there's only so much money. Let's hoard it. As entrepreneurs too, we're stashing money away you know, putting it away in savings accounts and we need X months of, I don't know how many expense, you know, income free um, months that we need to have in the bank and such. But it's like, there's a ton of capital out there. There's a ton of restoration jobs out there. There's a ton of everything out there. Everything that you think is scarce, you know, we'll have people say, oh, well, the restoration market isn't big enough for you to go build this kind of technology. It's like, yeah, it is. There's a ton of restoration contractors. Did you see the IICRC um, forum with all the instructors? It was like, a hundred and some instructors in a room doing uh, at the ISRC forum of meeting of the instructors. I was like, there's a hundred and some instructors training the industry. Imagine how big the industry is. And so, they're just scraping the surface. Like that hundred exactly. and something, right? Represents such a tiny, yeah. uh, you know, exactly. on the radar. Is there any other like kind of financial or money mindset that's shifted for you as, as the kind of the vision of what you're chasing and building is growing? What else has accompanied that in terms of money thoughts? Yeah. So as a venture backed startup um, versus bootstrap restoration company, you learn how to efficiently burn money. Um, so what I mean by that is how you can run at negative cash flows for future value. And that kind of flipped the script and it really highlighted some like self-limiting beliefs that I maybe had in, in restoration. Like, oh, it's it's not worth it to pay, I don't know, $5,000 to acquire a plumber that can refer you, I don't know, $40,000 a year over the next 10 years kind of thing. Um, so moving over into Albi, typically software companies that are venture backed and just software companies in general, like somebody pays 300 bucks a month for your subscription, will cost you way more than, it could even cost you 3,600 bucks, $4,000 to acquire that customer. So like you're basically paying the money now to acquire that customer and then that customer takes 12, 14, 16 months to pay back. And therefore you're operating at, at a negative um, versus being cash flow positive. And um, it really it really showed me like, wow, we're building future value. And the only way to b build future value is to consume this capital. But it kind of clicked um, in that sense because the value we've built, at least in enterprise value and such in the past four years here, 
was way more than we built in restoration in the past 10 years. Um, so you got to spend money to make money. You've got to burn money to make money. Moving money is more, that's what moves the economy. So like the more money you move around you, the more your economy flows um, versus the less money you move through the markets and the more money you keep yourself, um, the more you might be holding yourself back. And now I'm not saying go spend all your money, keep caution and stuff. Like I've got my own cautions and reserves, but also like don't hold on to like a ton of cash for the what ifs and as if it's scarce, go move the money, go pump it back in because it'll come back 10 X. Where do you, what's like your source for keeping yourself, um, I guess that competency, increasing that competency is the scope of, of your responsibilities continues to grow. What are, what are the two, three places that you go to consistently to grow that? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I do a lot, just because we have to talk to, to the capital markets all the time is I always try to gather information about what the markets are doing and what other people are doing, because in my opinion, I'm always driven to be in the top X percent. Now with a venture back company, it's like, no matter what happens in the world, capital is always going to flow to companies. It's just in a really good market, it'll flow to the top 50% of companies and a really bad market. You have, it'll only flow to the top 10% of companies. So I'm always trying to gather data points to understand in, in the people who always talk to companies, what's the top 10% look like and how can I make sure that our company is always in the top 10%. So to relate that back to restoration, it's always very important to understand, well, what, like to always networking with restoration companies, with other people that serve the restoration industry, maybe even brokers and understand, well, what's a really good restoration company look like? What's a really good restoration company trade for? What's it worth? What are they paying their project managers, their, their crew chiefs and such, and always trying to be in the top X percent. So, um, in all those areas. The second thing is I'm a part of a lot of mastermind groups and spend quite a bit in, in personal development um, and to be in rooms where I'm the smallest person in the room with a lot of other people of expertise. And what that's given me, it's, it's almost made me unstoppable in the fact of like from a mastermind group, one of my mentors wrote a book and now I all of a sudden am able to network with the publicist and the graphic copywriter and the person who's going to publish it and all that stuff. So um the who not how is powerful. And then getting into the rooms where you could always find the who is very powerful. And sometimes they cost, sometimes you, you have to network your way into them, but that's another thing that I do. And then the third thing is you will never know enough, like abundance mindset applies to knowledge, right? Knowledge isn't scarce. It's abundant. You must always be seeking out more knowledge and, um, not just seeking out, like consuming it, but learning it. So read the book, mark up the book, read the book again, journal every single day and every single interaction that you do, it's a learning experience. So just like Chris is writing things down right now, when you write things down, it, you actually catch what you learn. So it's not about what's taught, it's what's caught and you reinforce it within your brain and you like, it's, there's a difference between consuming content and studying stuff. So if you're always studying and you create a daily habit out of studying, you'll always be able to build yourself up. I love that. Did you get, I'm going to uh, dime myself out. Did you guys get into a morning routine at all? We, Last time? I can't remember. We didn't. We talked about fitness and we talked about some of that stuff, but this was also what our first, our last chat was over a month ago, a couple months ago. Exactly. Yeah. Month, month and a half ago. Yeah. We did talk briefly about morning routine. You mentioned um, that you were starting to plunge and you had uh, yeah. some fear around plunging, but that you were going to do more plunging. So how did that go so far? I've done more plunging. In fact, That's awesome. uh, I, I recently, one of the things I started doing was on the weekends, I, I've been doing multiple hot cold exposures, like for a, mm -hmm. period of a couple hours with my boys. It's been so fun because <laughs> my boys, they feel so manly, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> sitting, sweating in the sauna. And then we take turns. The first person get out jump, does the cold plunge and just doing it in succession. So yeah, yeah that's I've awesome. Been doing that. It's very fun. Congrats on that. In that's that awesome. Bucket, man. Like, you know, I've, I, you know, we totally, snoop on you all the time in terms of the socials right so it's like I'm, I'm watching you're taking shots in the gym not shots as in uh you know you're not doing tequila <laughs> shots but shots from the gym you know keyed in on some amazing things that are happening in your business and your and and the different things that you're chasing 
talk to me a little bit about that, the, just the balancing, the time blocking. Like, what are you doing in real physical terms to be in the right places, to give yourself the time to do the things that you want and to prioritize? Like, how do you balance that, man? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all connected. Health, wealth, love, and spirituality are the four pillars of life, in my opinion. If one's out of balance, it'll take a toll. Um, so I even incorporate like physical stuff into our standups with the sales team, for example, we'll go do burpees, jumping jacks, something like that. But I think like, if you're not showing up 110% at work, you're probably not showing up 110% in other aspects and it kind of mirrors itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, almost every day working out, I think sweat every day, you know, you, you tire the body to tame the mind. Um, and I went on a health journey about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and ever since then, I didn't really, I haven't stopped in, in the sense of working out, eating very right, doing things like stressing the body yourself. I also believe in like you stress versus distress. If yeah. you stress your body out, out yourself and you, if you embrace discomfort yourself, basically other things in the world don't stress you the same way. Yeah. Like an employee coming in and telling you X, Y, Z won't stress you as much because you're already used to you stressing your body to a higher degree, um, on a daily basis. And I'd rather stress myself out than have something else from left field come stress myself. Um, as far as morning routines, I focus on the mind, body, the spirit, and then moving the business or my life forward. Um, so those are kind of the four buckets that happened and it could be something as quick as an hour. It could be take a, typically it takes about an hour and a half to two hours. And it involves a workout, it involves eating right, it involves journaling, it involves reviewing my goals and analyzing myself. I have 12 goals for every single year um, and analyzing myself against those goals and seeing, okay, where where am I short and what can I do to move this forward? Um, and it's quick and it's simple, simple scales. You don't need to, I don't know, do a million cold plunges throughout the day. Yeah, You don't need to, I don't know, I'm not like a bodybuilder by any means. A workout could be as simple as, I don't know, go for a run or sometimes it's heck, go for a walk, right? Yeah. But um, it's those simple, small little improvements every single day that that really count. Do you ever struggle with, um, and I want to be cognizant of time, but do you ever struggle with discipline fatigue? You You know what I mean by that? Here, let me give you context just in case. Is like, I'm a pretty driven person. So like Enneagram, I'm an eight, you know, like I'm, I'm definitely the challenger. Like I, I'm, I'm, I like to be disciplined. I like to be making forward progress. Right. But I also have times where it's exhausting. Like there's, there's just, mm -hmm. it's hard to be disciplined. Right. And so I, I have phases where I feel like where I get discipline fatigue and there's kind mm -hmm. of this exercise or this battle that takes place where my system's kind of trying to sabotage me. Like, oh, you deserve it. You're tired, right? Like you mm -hmm. toe in the line, all these things. So anyways, in my mind, like I have these moments where I battle discipline. Mm -hmm. Do you ever run into something like that? And if you do, what do you do about it? A thousand percent actually. And, you know, ever since I, like, I think I've maybe, I've taken organization and systematization to like an extreme right? Like to where, if you look at my calendar from 4am to, you know, 9pm, everything's on there. And even my time with my wife's on the calendar. And, um, uh, the thing that woke me up a little bit was I was at, uh, at a mastermind group and I stood up and I asked somebody, um, who was speaking, who knew me so to, well, Hey, what's the number one thing holding me back? And they sat there and they looked at me and they were like, you know, in December, when you and your wife came to my house, yeah, I don't know. Something felt weird there, right? You guys were sitting on the couch and stuff like that, but I don't know. And then he went and told a story about him and his wife. And then he said something along the lines of, I feel like sometimes you're just doing the motions or I feel like sometimes people feel like you're just doing the motions. I'm like, hmm. And my co-founder was in the room. He stood up. He's like, dude, at lunch, hit me up. I got to tell you something. And then he sat down. I'm like, okay. So I went to my co-founder and I'm like, okay, what's up? And stuff like that. He's like, yeah, your wife told told my wife something along those lines too, like sometimes use those same exact words. Sometimes I feel like he's just doing the motions. I'm like, hmm, interesting. And then um, on the run the next day, we do this founder's run and such. And I was running with people and I talked to one of my buddies and stuff and he mentioned the same thing. Long story short, go confront my wife. I'm like, hey, we don't, we have a great relationship. We don't really fight much, stuff like that. We don't have friction. Everything's great. And she's like, 
yeah, but just because we don't always like fight stuff like that, you can't say like it's absolutely perfect and superlative and such. I was like, hmm, interesting. What do you mean by that, babe? And then she mentioned the same words. Long story short, those times, right, can be turned into, oh, you're just doing it because it's on your calendar or you're just doing it because of this. And it, it can add extra stress to your life. What I'm doing about it now is a lot, giving myself permission to be more spontaneous within the structure. So the structures don't go away. The discipline doesn't go away. But allow yourself a margin of error here and there. I'll move a meeting to go walk around the office if I need to. Like not like a very important meeting, but like time on my calendar to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. But I think the fine balance is, because you're an entrepreneur too, you want that freedom. That's what you want. The yeah. fine balance is don't throw it away or don't slip, right? Like give yourself permission to move that one meeting. Give yourself permission, I don't know, one day a week or one day every two weeks to take it easier at the gym or maybe go for a walk instead of going for a gym add some flexibility, right? But make sure that the discipline and the consistency at which you're showing up is still consistent because you could easily slip up into the other realm where it completely eliminates that discipline. Yeah, so I, like I don't know if that answered your question, but I think that's how I relate to what you were bringing up. Yeah, I think it, I think it's just important for listeners to hear the human side of people because the, at the end of the day, I think we could oversimplify every single interview that we've ever had with somebody of substance and competency. And that is, if you look at the level of discipline they engage on a day to day basis, there is a strong chance it looks higher than, you know, the person to the left and right. And that's part of where mm -hmm. all this achievement and success comes from. But I think we also can lose track of the fact that that discipline is not easy. Like they don't just yep. every day wake up, you know, and it's just like a, another day getting the box checked. It is hard to maintain that 100 percent discipline and we just get tired. Like it's appropriate for us to admit that we just get friggin tired. 100 uh, percent. But, you know. Well, dude, I think uh, this is a good opportunity for us to land the plane on this part, too. Um, I a question that I like to end with with a lot of our guests is just what are you most curious about right now and it could be a book that's provoking you it could be a, um, a mentor that has you in a particular spot looking at a particular part of your life uh, or a podcast you listen to whatever else but what are you most curious about personally right now or oriented towards yeah one of the things that's been on my mind well yeah, I guess the, the biggest thing that's been on my mind um, has been along the side of what I've been explaining on the co-creation front, on the family front. I'm really curious without adding the boundaries and the systems of business, which my wife personally is like super against, how to boost co-creation and unity and mission within my family. Family life, familiar life, family life, I'd call it. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a fine line, right? Because it, you know, business maybe is my super strength, and just throwing business principles at it won't work because marriages and relationships are um, a fine balance and a delicate balance. But truly, like, how can I, what does that 110% co creation between my wife and I look like? And between my wife, my daughter, and I, and, and the future. Uh, little dudas that are running around. So yeah, that's something I'm, one of the things I'm very interested in and um, working at currently. Mm. Love it, man. That's awesome, dude. All right. Okay. Not yeah. alone. <laughs> what about you? You know, for me, it's interesting, also personal, uh, but, but I think the implications of these things, right? They extend, reach everything. I have lately been getting into uh, internal family systems, IFS. It's a it's a type of therapy. Are you familiar with IFS? No, I'm not. But tell okay. me more. So, so the, the basic premise of it is, is that, you know, we as individuals, we have these individual parts inside of us. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I wrote an article about this in uh, CNR a while back. This, this sense of when, when we tend to get into a difficult or stressful situation, have some encounter negative emotions, we tend to, to completely and totally identify with those things, I am really stressed out right now about this thing. And, and part of the um, sort of the principles behind IFS is adopting more of a um, 
more of a nuanced view of yourself, right? That when we when we encounter those negative or stressful things or emotions that were were are coming at us, instead thinking of it as part of us, right? There's a there's a perspective Separating. taking, yeah, 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 that separates from myself and who I am these emotions that I have happen to be encountering or these stressors or these anxieties. And, and so it's just, it, it, it goes obviously a lot deeper than that, but um, yeah. the, the founder of uh, internal family systems is Richard Swartz and he's written uh, a book called no bad parts. Mm -hmm. And it's just this idea that um, in order for us to be engaged in self leadership, right? That this really is the concept of self-leadership is recognizing there's all of these disparate parts inside of me that have, um, have originated from experiences that I've had in the past. Um, often they take the form of a protector, right? Mm -hmm. We've encountered certain hardship or suffering or abuse or whatever early on in life. And these parts of us take shape and they take on roles. And I just find it really interesting as a leader, um, looking at, okay, how does this, how do these parts and what are these parts inside of me? And then how do I also recognize these parts in other people? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And think more yeah. holistically about others in my relationship with others. And it's like, okay, what might be happening inside them, uh, in their various parts that's causing this behavior or this way of that, that they tend to show up. So anyway, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. You can Google it. He's he, this guy, Richard Swartz, been on a lot of really great podcasts too. So I've just been digging into that lately. There's a huge spiritual parallel to what you're talking about. I did some spiritual work recently, but you're the feeler of the feeling yeah. blank. You are not blank. You're not stressed. You're the feeler of the feeling stressed. Yeah. And almost like identifying you as your soul yeah. versus your ego or your con your brain or like your physical body as something separate and understanding like the difference between the two. And there's like, we can go on a whole episode on that, but it was very interesting to find the correlation there. <laughs> yeah. We, we may have to, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting uh, yeah. place to hang. I, I think for me, it's, it's almost like you can almost see it a little bit in some of the questions I was asking you. It's like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in this place right now where I feel like I am, uh, creating new boundaries maybe and and new perceptions maybe of what's appropriate in response to cash management money management like the role mm -hmm. it plays in my life because I think you know like growing up in a, around kind of um I don't know for lack of a better maybe like protestant kind of christian environments mm -hmm. you just get a weird understanding of money and, and, and it's like, and it permeates into all sorts of stuff. So even as a business owner, like a lot of those boundaries have been stretched and moved, but there's still like this fundamental core process that's happening probably more so at a subconscious level that I'm mm. trying to get a grip on. And then I think another place that I, I feel like it say, stays in a similar vein is just my own personal priority. So I'm, I'm 47, uh, we're going to be 48 in November and man, dude, I am hitting a moment in my life where I'm really tired of giving a shit about stuff that people tell me I'm supposed to care about. Like I'm just burnt on fitting all these other person's priorities on top of the things that I know when I'm alone thinking about my own personal vision for my family and our friend, our sphere and all those things. It's like those things have often been in contrast or or in contention with those and i'm just like in this space of what's the right line of being bold and saying no and not agreeing to the things that you just straight up don't agree to versus becoming the pendulum swinging to the point where now it's a detriment and it actually is mm -hmm. a dysfunction in relationship and it actually is taking away from me i'm trying to find that line and i honestly don't know where it is yet like i i find myself shifting back and forth on this what feels like a very sharp line. So that's kind of where my, my head has been. And I've, I'm finding some content of value, but I think a lot of it comes down to just having conversations with guys like you, where I'm like, I just need to hear someone else's perspective that I respect by the way they carry themselves, you know? So awesome. Yeah, there's mine. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Good stuff. Well, we're going to, we're going to record all the, all the various ways that people can get in touch with you and the companies that you lead and the stuff that you participate in, in our show notes uh, from the episode, but man, this has been fun, dude. And I think we yeah. identified what our next conversation is going to have to be around spiritual things and what's going on between our ears. 
uh dive hard into that next time so for sure let's do it yeah thanks for your time dude. thanks for hanging man yeah this was a pleasure and thanks so much for your doing for the industry you guys are clearly exposing a lot of different mindsets and beliefs to the restoration industry and i think that's that's the number one thing holding this industry back and um you guys are nailing it right on the head so yeah, appreciate wow. that thanks a lot Thank man you. okay well until next time take care guys yeah see you later